so uh, I'm Allison Okamura, and on behalf of myself and Max Schwager, Nathan's co-advisor, we're happy to uh, have you all here for Nathan's thesis defense. Um, especially glad to see so many of his family members. Uh, uh, both very young <laughs> and older on the line. Uh, and to kick things off, uh, Mac and I wanted to say a few words about Nathan. So I'm going to share just a few slides this time. Um, many of you, of course, already know Nathan, some of you much better than, than I do, uh, but uh, by way of introduction, uh, we were really lucky to recruit Nathan to our mechanical engineering department here at Stanford. Uh, he came through BYU and uh, joined the master's program, and uh, we are so happy he decided to stay for the PhD. And during his time at Stanford, he also did an internship at Facebook's Reality Labs, uh, where he's actually set up to uh, go to work at once, uh, once he wraps, wraps this thing up. Um, Nathan has, uh, I'll, I'll just speak for, for me first, uh, he's been a, a wonderful part of the research lab in, uh, in our group and has collaborated with so many students. Uh, and and provided advice on so many projects that uh, we will we'll miss him when he's when he's uh, moved on. And I'm going to pass it on to Mac to talk next. Okay. I'm going to try to. Okay. Awesome. Go ahead, Mac. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Max Schwager. Uh, as Allison said, I I was a co-advisor along with Allison. Um, so I want to talk about one of Nathan's many uh, extraordinary qualities. Um, so, most professors like to um, run their research groups in the sense that we have a collection of wonderful graduate students that we work with, and, uh, and this is what allows us to produce great research, and that's the typical model. So Nathan, um, being the natural leader that he is, so this is the property of, this is the quality that I'm emphasizing is his leadership skills. Nathan came in as a, as a new graduate student at Stanford and decided to flip this model on its head. So I'm a proud member of Nathan's um, faculty research group. Nathan <laughs> has the amazing property of getting lots of professors interested in his research ideas and, uh, and then collecting them together and managing them. So, <laughs> so Nathan runs his own faculty research group, um, which include people from my lab, I mean myself, of course, and Allison, and uh, Sean Fulmer, and uh, Elliot Cox. Um, this actually spreads not only across two different departments, but across two different universities. It's pretty remarkable. So to give you a little more detail on this, um, when I first met, met Nathan, I think it was back in uh, 2016, uh, I had recently moved to Stanford, and Nathan walked through my door and, and in his very approachable folksy way started talking about an idea for a robot that just consisted of a giant kind of connected web of, of bars that can um, grow and shrink. And I thought, well, that's a strange idea. And, uh, and then I thought, well, that's, that, I really am not quite sure how to control a robot like that, and I'm not quite sure how to model a robot, a robot like that. That sounds pretty interesting. Sure, I'll jump on board. Let's work on that. And then, uh, you know, going about my business, I started talking with Allison, for example, and I found out, oh, you know, Allison tells me there's this great student who's working on this idea of this morphing robot connected by a bunch of, you know, that consists of a bunch of connected bars. And I thought, wow, okay, he's working with Allison too. And I run into Sean, and Sean says, hey, I've got this interesting student who's got this great idea about a robot connected by a bunch of bars that change length. I thought, oh. Wow, okay. <laughs> so he's got a whole collection of people working with him. Anyway, he's managed to use his leadership qualities to great advantage. And I think the research that he's produced is really remarkable. So I'll pass it on to Allison to talk about another one of Nathan's remarkable qualities. So the other remarkable quality I wanted to discuss was Nathan's uh, productivity. And you'll see this from the really fascinating research, which Mac mentioned that he'll talk about during his PhD defense. But I thought it might be nice for everyone to see a list of the papers that he's contributed to, none of which are in his thesis at all, as far as I know. So, 
these are all projects, some of which he, he led and then some of which he collaborated with other people in my lab or Sean Fulmer's lab or Max Schwager's lab and many involving Elliot Fox as well. Uh, that uh, there's just this, been this amazing uh, level of uh, productivity and activity around his work. Uh, but, but there are different kinds of product productivity. There's productivity in work and there's, and there's productivity in, in life. Uh, <laughs> so I've been particularly impressed with, with uh, Nathan and, and really Andrea's <laughs> productivity uh, throughout both before and, and during the period of, of his PhD. Uh, well, most recently, uh, uh, Lucy, who uh, I, I saw from Andrea's video, has, has joined us. Um, so it's just been amazing to me, um, and I think in large part due to the support of Nathan's wonderful family that he has managed to be so productive in work and life um, during this period, um, in addition to demonstrating these amazing leadership skills uh, that Mac mentioned. And with, with that, uh, we'll, we'll stop uh, torturing him and let, let Nathan go on to tell us about his PhD research. Awesome. Thank you so much for the for the awesome introduction. And uh, I'll have a few words to say about Allison and Mac and how great they've been throughout my whole PhD at the at the conclusion of my of my presentation today. And so um, I'm excited to present today. Like we discussed before, it's a little bit of a bummer that we're not in person, but kind of an advantage that our, our audience is perhaps much broader than it would have been were we were we sitting in, in person on, on campus. Um, just a few logistics before we get started. I've tried to reserve this top right square of each slide um, for a spot to kind of put my, my talking head. Um, so if you, depending on how you have your screen configured, you can go ahead and put me up there. Um, and that shouldn't cover too much important content. Um, and with that, I'd like to begin my, my thesis presentation, which is on the design and control of soft shape changing robots. And so to start, I want to show this video. And this is the type of um, task right now that at which robots excel. So these, this is a collection of robotic arms, and they're assembling 3D printers, one after the other. And the video is actually looped, but you can hardly tell that it's looped because it, it's just so smooth what they're doing. And so right now, there's robots all over the world that are, that are doing things like this. However, there's a few limitations that I would like to address with my work. Um, and these limitations are as follows. These robots tend to be task specific. So each of these robots does one particular thing, screw on the screw, attach the motherboard. Um, and there's really not a lot of adaptability of the same robot to different tasks without changing out the end vector or changing the hardware configuration of the robot itself. In addition, these robots work in a very structured environment. So were I to come and push one of these 3D printers three inches to the right or left, um, these robots would struggle they're not very adaptable to the types of uncertainty you encounter in the real world as opposed to in a very structured environment. In addition, and perhaps most significantly, there's not any people present at all. So in typ typically, when these robots are operating in a factory, um, they'll operate behind a, behind a cage to prevent the robots from, from hurting the people. And so what I'd like to do is, is really make advances in robotics that address these three challenges. And my, my inspiration has been a little bit from, from two sets of fictional robots. Um, and these robots include Transformers and, and Baymax from Big Hero 6. So these Transformer robots have this ability to dramatically change shape um, from a robot to a car. And on the other hand, you have a robot like Baymax, which because of its soft, inflated nature is, is soft, adaptable, and really safe around humans. So um, to some extent, we'd love to get these same abilities, the shape change ability and this kind of human compatibility into, into physical robotic devices. And just to give a little glimpse of the, of the type of thing that, that we'll uh, eventually end up talking about in this presentation, um, this is one of the robots that, that we've developed throughout my PhD. It's a large scale robot. This is a basketball that you can kind of see for scale. Um, and it's capable of changing its shape to do interesting tasks. For example, here it's capable of, of, of lifting this basketball. Um, and so throughout this presentation, we're going to kind of work up to the, to the design and control of this robot. One of my guiding insights throughout my PhD, um, and that will be a theme of this presentation, is that really to develop robots that are more capable to enable these types of behaviors that we talk about. You really need to focus on two things. You need to focus on the co-design of both the robot and its controller. So it's not sufficient to just build a better robot, or it's not sufficient just to, 
you know, design better algorithms for an existing robot. There's often a lot of progress that can be unlocked by really looking at both of these problems in a, in a coupled fashion. And I hope to be able to highlight that in my talk today. And so as a general outline, I'm going to have three main components of my, of my talk today. The first part, I'm going to talk about the control of shape-changing robotic trusses. So this will be very mathematical and kind of focused on the algorithms of the control. Second, we'll talk about building a soft truss robot. And then for the third part, we'll talk about control, distributed control of, of a truss robot. And so to begin with this first section, the control of shape-changing robotic trusses. So some of our inspiration has actually come from a little bit of a, an unusual source. So in the computer graphics world, one of the most common parameterizations of shape is with a triangle mesh or with a mesh. And you can kind of see here this cow and this triceratops represented as a collection of points and, and edges on that, that define the surface. Now there's some really interesting work on mesh morphing, which is basically taking the same mesh and finding a way to smoothly change the shape of that mesh in, in, into a number of different shapes. Um, so there was some animals morphing one from the other. Here's some different statues morphing back and forth. And as a roboticist, it's hard not to look at this and think about how cool it would be if there was a robot that can perform some of these morphing type figures. What if you just had a, a blob of robot that could change shape to do, to do anything that you needed to do? If it needed to climb over some rough terrain, it could grow legs. If it needed to roll, it could turn into a ball. If it needed to grasp a complicated geometry, it could change shape to be the perfect gripper for a grasp. Um, however, this computer graphics work, of course, does not account for the physics of the motion. Um, so our work has focused on this concept of a robotic mesh, where we essentially take this computer graphics concept of nodes and lines, and we turn it into a robotic concept where we have universal joints whose position is given by the variable P. And then we have linear actuators connecting these different joints. So one key challenge is how can I control the lengths of each of these independent actuators that can extend and contract in order to control the shape of the, of the nodes? And, and this really gives sense to this. We could create this really um, morphable metal, this really morphing robot that can dramatically change its shape. Now, this isn't certainly a, an idea that, that's our own. There's been a lot of interesting work, um, as other people have seen the promise of this idea. And there's also been a number of control algorithms applied to these types of robots. There's some, some controllers um, that use repeated graphical motifs. So for example, this robot is essentially a chain of tetrahedrons. And if you know how to control one tetrahedron, you can chain those control algorithms together to be able to control the whole chain. There's also been really interesting work by many groups. One, one example here on this reconfigurable truss, um, they've employed some sampling-based motion planners. So they have a sampling-based technique that allows them to determine how to change the actuator lengths to achieve, to achieve different shapes. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take a model-based approach, but one that applies to general robotic systems. So there's no need that the structure meets a certain criteria. And so if we look at an example robot here, each actuator in this robot is gonna define a constraint. The, the distance, the length of one actuator, fixes the distance between two points for every edge in the network. Now, it turns out that it's actually really hard to reconstruct the position of the points from just the actuator lengths. And this actually points to some really interesting and open problems in rigidity theory. However, what's interesting for us in a robotic sense is what we can do is we could square this relationship and essentially take its derivative. Um, that allows us to develop this differential relationship between the speed of the actuator change and the motion, the speed of the nodes. Essentially, what we can do is we can combine these relationships into this um, nonlinear relationship. It's a function of the robot state, but it's a linear mapping between the motion of the nodes of the robot. Here we concatenate all the p's in this variable x and the motion of the actuators. So the key here is we want to invert this relationship. We want to know how the actuators change the nodes. And that really brings, brings us to the question of what is the size and rank of this R matrix, which is known as the rigidity matrix. And so it turns out that that rank of that matrix is connected to this property known as infinitesimal rigidity. So here we're going to imagine taking two graphs. Um, these are the same type of robot. We can just imagine bringing this node down by shortening these two edges. Now the key here is that if we have this property of infinitesimal rigidity, it means that the robot is controllable. We have this property of controllability, meaning that we can achieve any desired velocity of the nodes by changing the actuators. So for example, if we think of this node 
I can move this node in any direction by controlling the length of these two actuators. However, if I'm in this configuration, which is a configuration where the robot is not infinitesimally rigid, I cannot control whether this node moves up or down if I lengthen or shorten these actuators. So the key here is if I'm infinitesimally rigid like this robot here, what I can do is I can plan my robot's trajectory not in the space of actuator commands, but in the space of the node positions, which is much simpler, and then simply extract the actuator commands provided that infinitesimal rigidity is maintained. If we have this property of infinitesimal rigidity, um, and then we impose some additional constraints that ground the robot to the outside world, what we can essentially do is invert this relationship and have a direct mapping between how the actuators change length and how the nodes move in 3D space. So how they move up and down, left and right, compared to how the actuators lengthen and shorten. And this is essentially the Jacobian of the robot, um, which allows us this powerful relationship between inputs and outputs, and then even also allows us to reason about things like how forces applied on the robot are resolved into different actuators. So our approach then for control is if we have this property of infinitesimal rigidity, what we can do is we can define a cost function as a function of the node positions, and then define some set of constraints. These may things like that we want the, the ground feet of the robot, the support feet of the robot to remain stationary um, so they're not sliding across the ground, or that we want certain nodes or certain actuators to move in, in a certain way. Um, so we can define these constraints. In addition, we also have to define some constraints that the robot is, is physically feasible. Now these feasibility constraints are actually gonna make the, this optimization problem a nonlinear and non-convex optimization because of the form of these feasibility constraints. What these constraints consist of is essentially we want to maintain the property of infinitesimal rigidity, um, which is what's essential to be able to back out the actuator commands. In addition, we have a number of geometric constraints. These are things that are gonna couple the, des the physical design of the robot um, with our control design, which type of behaviors are possible possible with our control. These physical geometric constraints include things like the actuators not colliding, each actuator having some maximum and minimum length, and some minimum angle between connected, between connected robots. And so what we can essentially do is we can formulate that optimization problem and then solve it online. So for example, this is a, a randomly generated robot. So it's kind of a, a tangle of actuators. There's no specific structure we're leveraging. And we're solving that optimization problem iteratively online to move the center of mass in a prescribed uh, direction while respecting those physical constraints. And so despite this like simple problem formulation, we essentially end up with this almost like amoeba-like gate of the robot. It kind of uh, you know, moves its actuators around and coordinates the actuator motions to achieve this amoeba-type gate by solving this optimization online. Now, if we don't have a random robot, but if we have a robot with some sort of structure or symmetry, one thing that we can do is instead of solving this optimization instantaneously and iteratively online, what we can do is we can solve it over a horizon. So here we want this robot to start and end, or both of these robots, to start and end in, in identical configurations. And then we can optimize over many time steps in between to get this type of punctuated rolling locomotion um, that minimizes a cost function. In this case, the cost function, we want to move the actuators as little as possible to achieve the, this type of motion. Um, and this applies to, to different robot designs that respect some certain symmetry. And so in conclusion, in this section, we've been able to develop the kinematics for arbitrary collection of linear actuators. So no matter how you kind of tangle up these linear actuators, if you maintain this property of infinitesimal rigidity, um, we're able to control the robot to do interesting behaviors. And we've developed this controller using ideas from both multi-robot control to enforce this infinitesimal rigidity constraint, and also optimization techniques, nonlinear optimization techniques, in order to control the robot's motion. And so with the completion of this controller design portion, uh, we're gonna start uh, discussing the building of, of a soft trust robot. And just as I mentioned before, this, this concept of this robotic truss or robotic mesh has, has seen a lot of interest. And there have been a number of hardware embodiments, just as there have been a number of, of control embodiments as well. So I've highlighted a few of these, of these different um, experiments that, that different researchers have done. And despite some really impressive results, there's really some fundamental challenges that, is, is, that are faced when building these robots. Typically, the ability of the robot to change its shape is really a function of the extension ratio of each actuator. So we need actuators that can extend really long and then shrink really short. 
It's challenging in a trust robot because the actuators are not just providing the action, they are also um, providing the structure of the robot. So it can be very challenging to design uh, high extension ratio actuators that can also serve as the structure of the robot. In addition, conventional electromechanical actuators are often extremely brittle. And so if we want to think about a robot that's functioning alongside people, or perhaps that's in a real world environment, perhaps receiving impacts as it, as it rolls or moves around, um, a brittle actuator is, is not going to lead to a robot that's, very, uh, that's, that's capable of working for an extended period of time in the real world. And so typically, many researchers have had to develop custom actuators and have really had to develop really interesting approaches to try and, to try and overcome these limits. One of our very first ideas was if we want high extension ratio and we want to be soft and not brittle, let's instead of designing a rigid actuator, let's design a, a pneumatic actuator. Now, the field of, of soft, robots has, soft robotics has focused on designing, um, designing robots out of soft materials that have a number of interesting properties. This is an actuator that I developed early in my PhD that has extremely high extension ratio. It can change length by about a factor of 10. Um, in addition, because it's inflated with air, it's very soft and compliant, so it has some natural robustness. Um, in addition, this, ro this robot even has some other properties where it can tune its stiffness independent of its length. However, this uh, experience really introduced me to what I call one of the, the dirty secrets of inflated robots. Um, here are many, many amazing inflated robots. They can achieve all sorts of interesting motion, adaptability, and compliance. Um, often they have strength to weight ratios of in the tens or hundreds or even thousands. But the key limitation of all of these robots, including, including my own, is that they are typically tethered to an external source of compressed air. So all of these amazing soft robots are reliant off-screen on a giant air compressor, um, which is not very soft, which is not very adaptable, um, and which is not very, very portable either. Now, if, if there may be cases where such a thing is, is OK. There may be applications where a, a tether is, is, is fine. And there have been some soft robots that have tried to carry compressors on board. Um, but it has typically limited the speed of the robot or the, or the adaptability of the robot. So we would love to be able to gain the benefits of a soft robot without being hamstrung by some of these real challenges of relying on an external source of compressed air. And so to do so, we kind of went back to the drawing board. So far, we've been thinking of these robots as joints connecting actuators. And so each actuator has to house enough material to extend and contract. And to extend or contract, it must either push air in, inflate, or it must suck air out to inflate or, con to inflate or contract. And that's really what provides, uh, what limits the speed and applicability of these devices. So we took approach that, that is actually dramatically different. Instead of a series of actuators, what we did is we took a, continu a continuous single member, we bend it into a loop, and then we actuate the robot not by changing the edge lengths directly, but by moving the joints of the robot, which simultaneously will lengthen one edge and shorten another. So the key advantage here is that the total perimeter of the robot is constant, meaning that we don't have to be pumping air in and out. We just can maintain a fixed amount of air within the robot. So what does that look like in practice? Um, this is our robotic roller here. It has some cylindrical rollers that essentially pinch this inflated fabric tube. By pinching the tube, it creates a passive joint. It's almost like if you take a, like a clown balloon and if you twist it, that twist creates an effective joint in the balloon. In this case, the twisted, the, the pinch of the rollers creates an effective joint between two, two edges of the tube. And in the end, we end up having a structure where we're capable of moving the joints relative to the structure instead of actuating the structure um, about the joints itself. And so what we call this is we are going to call this an isoperimetric robot. Iso meaning constant and parametric referring to the perimeter of the robot or the sum of the edge lengths of the robot. So what this means is that the sum of all the edge lengths are going to be constants. We're going to be moving air back and forth throughout the structure, but we're actually not ever pumping it across a pressure gradient um, and we're not pumping it or venting it from the atmosphere either. So this robot consists, its primary structural elements are inflated fabric tubes. And what this means is that the robot has a natural softness and compliance. The primary actuation element are these roller modules. These are uh, DC motors that can essentially move one joint up and down the tube in one degree of freedom. 
And then we connect these roller modules one to the other using these universal joints. The result is that we've created this large scale robot and that is capable of coordinating the motion of these roller modules to do interesting behavior. So here's a case where we broadcast commands to each of the roller modules. Each roller module houses a battery and its own microcontroller um, and is capable of moving the right amount up and down the tube. So we tell this roller module, move 10 inches down the tube. It does so by coordinating those motions. We can move the center of mass of the robot out of the support polygon, and we kind of get this punctuated rolling or kind of tipping type locomotion. And so again, this is all done with an inflated robot body, but totally untethered from any, from any source of compressed air. One other thing I'd like to point out is this video is, is at real time. I, I certainly would not claim that this robot is like a, a fast dynamic robot, but compared to the speeds at which other soft robots move, especially untethered soft robots, this robot's actually moving extremely fast. Um, it's capable of performing this kind of, you know, human speed locomotion and that, and that we're able to watch this video without getting too, bo too bored in real time, which is, which is somewhat unique for an untethered soft robot. Um, this is another example of the robot out in the real world. Every time we would do these experiments, we'd get a big crowd of mostly summer campers gathering around to, to watch this robot move around. So I have, some, I have some good memories of that. So before showing a few more demonstrations of this robot, I want to talk a little bit about the design that, that went into this robot. So the key component of this robot are these roller modules. Essentially, we want to be able to pinch the tube between cylinders in a way that makes an effective joint. So we want it to be really, really easy to bend the tube about the joints. Um, but we want the tube to be stiff because it's the primary structural element of the robot. And so to do so, um, the first thing we did is, well, we built an experimental setup and measured the torque required to change the angle of this tube. However, we also wanted a model that would allow us a little more insight into this process that would be able to allow us to inform the design. And so our model looked like this. We're going to essentially consider a cross section of the tube. So these are the cylindrical rollers and these are the pinch tube. What we're going to use is the principle of virtual work. So what this means is we're going to relate the work done by the fluid inside the robot, which is the pressure times the change in volume of the fluid. That work is going to be equal to the torque times the change in angle. Now, a key realization that we had here is that because this robot is composed of a fabric, um, the volume of the robot is going to be a function of only the angle, not the pressure. Now, what that means is that because the fabric is essentially flexible but inextensible, that means I can wrinkle the fabric easily, but I can't stretch it. What this means is that if I inflate this tube at a fixed angle, no matter what, whether I put in 1 psi of air, 10 psi, or 100 psi of air, um, this tube is going to go to essentially the same shape. The, the air is always going to want to maximize the volume of that tube. And so the key here is if I can find this function, what is the volume as a function of the angle, I could then write this expression that the torque as a function of angle is the pressure times the change in volume with the change in angle. So the key is really defining this volume as a function of the angle. The way we do that is we essentially parameterize this tube. We assume that the top and bottom arc here in blue and pink are the same length and that these are constant curvature arcs. We then assume that every cross section, so if I were to slice this tube in cross sections, looks something like this. It's flat on the top and bottom and semicircular on the, on the sides. What we do then is we optimize over these radii, the, the radii of these arcs, to determine what is the maximum volume of the shape. Um, we know the air is going to maximize the volume. So whatever shape maximizes the volume is a good candidate for the shape of the tube. How does this work in practice? So what I'm going to show here on the right here is the predicted shape from our model, the predicted shape of the tube. And on the left, I'm going to show the alignment of the data and the experiment, the, the analytic model and the experimental data. And so what you see is that as we bend the tube, um, we get a pretty good agreement between the model predictions and the data predictions until a point right here, where our model predicts the tube begins to self-interfere. So as the tube is bending, it begins to collide with itself. At that point, our model is no longer valid. It doesn't account for that effect. So what we see is a dramatic increase in the experimentally measured torque. What happens if we reduce the roller size? We get a similar effect. We get a lower torque with a smaller roller, but we get an earlier onset of the self-interference. And again, with even smaller rollers, we get further reduced torque and then a, a, an earlier increase in, in the onset of the self-interference and high torque. So what we see here are kind of conflicting design criteria. 
we would want to use as small of rollers as possible because we want this torque to be as low as possible. We want this joint to be very flexible. However, we also want to avoid this self-interference. So we want to use as big of rollers as possible to avoid the self-interference. So we need a way to uh, counteract these kind of um, these two different criteria. And in the end, we came up with a mechanical solution that does exactly that. Instead of using one set of rollers, we actually use two different sets of cylindrical rollers. This eliminates the self-interference into much higher angles um, while maintaining the low torque performance of a really, really small roller. And you can see here, we want to be able to move this roller back and forth along the tube. We can gear these sets of rollers together through this gear train shown. And by using a motor to drive a single gear, we can drive all four of these rollers to move up and down the tube. So to kind of summarize this effect, if I take an inflated tube with no rollers at all and bend it, I get a torque angle behavior like this, this blue line here, relatively high torque across a wide range of angles. If I use one set of cylindrical rollers, I get this red line. I get really, really low torque until the onset of self-interference, and then I essentially end with a, with a similar torque to the, to the no roller case once that self-interference begins. If I use this double roller design, I achieve really low torque across the entire range of angles that our robot will operate on. So this is a good thing. It means that our robot, we're able to create this very flexible joints even while maintaining strong tubes across a wide range of angles. The other key modeling component for this robot is we need to predict how driving these rollers is going to change the position of the nodes. So in the previous section, we talked about how changing the uh, edge lengths affects the node positions. What we're going to talk about now is how driving the motors at the rollers changes the edge lengths. And so what happens if we take the motor angle and we multiply it by the radius of the roller, we're able to get the distance we change. And if we walk around this robot like this, like if we drive roller one, we're going to shorten edge one and lengthen edge two. That corresponds to this negative one and one in this column. Um, we move to the second roller, we add another column. A third roller, we add another column. Um, if you're familiar a little bit with graph theory, this is essentially the directed incidence matrix of this robot. Um, directly relates, linear relates, the motion of the rollers to the motion of the edge lengths. Now, one interesting effect is that if I turn on all the rollers, I could essentially drive the tube like a tank tread. It would move continuously, so I'd get constant change of the rollers and no change in the edge lengths. That would actually be useful in some cases, but in practice, what we need is we need a place to end the tube, to attach the ends of the tube and to insert a valve. Um, so we essentially remove a column from this matrix and insert a passive node, such that we have one roller that doesn't move up and down the tube. Um, and that corresponds to this. And so you'll see here that no matter how much, no matter my input, no matter what velocities I send to these rollers, the sums of the edge length change will always be zero. So the perimeter of the robot is always going to be conserved under those kinematics. And so in our previous results, we had this Jacobian that related the edge length change to the node position change. What we do now is we add this directed incidence matrix, which we're going to call B. And we have the Jacobian that relates exactly the motion of the, the roller modules up and down the tube to the motion of the nodes in 3D space, up, down, left, right. And this Jacobian allows us to predict that motion and then also allows us, if we know the forces applied on the robot, allows us to predict the forces required at the roller modules. So to give a little bit of validation, here's a case where we take the physical robot and we send it a series of commands and then we recreate those series of commands in a simulated robot. And the simulated robot does not have all the information of the physical robot here. What it knows is the time the commands were sent and then it's assuming that each roller is moving at a constant speed. And so essentially what we get here is that we're able to capture the behavior of the system um, using, using our kinematic model um, as we move through a variety of, of different configurations. Um, and you could also see too, here too, we use a basketball for scale. I'm a big basketball fan, so you'll notice in lots of these, lots of these videos, there's, there's a basketball provided for scale. Another thing that the compliance structure of the robot lends is really a robust and compliant overall robot system. So this is uh, Zach Hammond. He's one of the, he's my co-author on this, on this work. And here he's participating in a, in a little bit of robot abuse. So he's going, he's kind of pushing the robot, deforming the robot. Because the structure of the robot is primarily just soft and inflated, none of this damage is, is permanent. And in fact, most of the time, the robot's capable of springing back into the configuration on its own. Um, to provide a little bit more of a, of a sense of scale, we're going to do a little bit of a, a playing around with the robot here. 
So this robot um, is, is approximately, approximately human scale. Um, it has this robustness. It's light enough that, that Zach and I are capable of, of, of carrying it on our own. Um, and again, that's because the structure is, is primarily just inflated. Here I'm able to, uh, to go inside the robot and the robot's gonna kind of roll over my, my 6.3 frame. Um, and then I'll also be able to interact with it in, in some ways, like here I'm gonna be able to stand on the robot. And so again, this is highlighting the kind of soft, human-safe nature of this robot um, and some of the things that, that, that it's able to do because of the soft compliance structure and the overall kind of lightweight adaptability of the structure as well. Here it will let me out as well. All right, so another thing that the compliance really helps with um, is also with manipulation. So for example, we have a basketball here. We want to grasp this basketball. Now, if I were to perform this task with a, with a rigid robot, this would require extreme precision to be able to pinch the basketball just the right amount. However, because the structure is compliant, um, it kind of naturally will, will grasp the basketball. So in a, in a very simple way, I kind of naturally obtain this good grasp on the basketball. And so this is highlighting how the compliance of the robot really allows it to adapt to some uncertainty in the task or environment. Another interesting thing that we can do is by driving this roller, we can essentially spin an object within a grasp. So here we have this basketball. By moving this tube back and forth, we can spin this basketball within the grasp. And classically, this sort of in-hand manipulation is, is a very, very challenging problem in, in, in robotic manipulation. But because of the compliance of the structure and this kind of continuous motion of the tube, this task, which is classically very challenging, ends up being something that this robot can actually do very naturally. I'll also note that in addition to the compliance helping uh, with the grasping task, the compliance also allows this joint to move anywhere along the tube. So we can get this really, really move the joint up and down the tube dramatically because the tube is just a soft structure. The joint can exist anywhere in the structure. Now, another advantage of this robot is that because it is composed of just identical robotic roller modules, we can take the robot apart and reconfigure it into an entirely new robot. Um, here we make a 2D robot by putting each of the roller modules on carts. And there you just saw an inflation step. So we, when the robot's deflated, it's just a pile of, of fabric in these roller modules. So by inflating, it can really pop into a much larger shape. And then by using the exact same control architecture, the exact same hardware as before, we can have this 2D robot drive between a number of different shapes. So it changed between a triangle, uh, a hexagon, it's gonna change into a square shape. And then here at the end, it's gonna change into a, into a grasper and it's gonna catch a basketball that, that we roll in. And so again, the same hardware, but enabling a new type of robot. Now, everything that we've shown so far has been the, a single tube mounted in different triangular paths. Um, to show that we can do something else too, in this case, we've also actually taken one tube and routed it through the entire robot. So this is one continuous tube. Um, the air is at the same pressure and can flow continuously between this entire tube with very low resistance. So the single tube architecture enables some interesting behaviors. For example, if I want to shorten one edge and lengthen this edge, in this case, I just drive one roller module. It's a relatively easy type of behavior. However, if I want to do an equivalent motion with these edges, since this has no roller, I actually have to drive the tube through the entire robot, um, back and forth through the entire robot. Also, the fact that I have a single tube means that I could potentially shorten many of the edges of the robot and extend some of the edges super long. So here, I'm going to get extremely short all these other edges and pass all of that extra or residual length, pass it to these two edges that can become extremely long um, in order to enable kind of a large reach of the robot. And this is kind of highlighting that with this mo mobile joint architecture, we can essentially achieve really high extension ratio of actuators because we're not storing and deploying material locally. We're moving material smoothly throughout this continuous robot. So in conclusion, this isoparametric robot is a robot that's compliant because of its soft structure. It's untethered because of its constant volume nature. It can undergo dramatic shape change. It has many, many controlled degrees of freedom um, and the ability to coordinate them and change the length of each edge dramatically. And then it also has this modular effect. Um, and so to return to some of those criteria that we mentioned at the very beginning, it's human safe because it's compliant. 
The fact that it's untethered and can change shape means it can adapt to real world environments and its modularity and its shape change help make it applicable to different tasks. So certainly we haven't solved all of these problems, but we've developed a robot that's really made significant advances into making a robot that's human safe, adaptable, and applicable to a wide variety of tasks. So that concludes our construction of the robot. For this third part, we're going to talk about the distributed control of a truss robot. And so to do so, I want to review briefly how the control was working in, in the past section. What we did essentially is we had a bunch of different roller modules, um, robot nodes, and we were broadcasting commands to these nodes that were essentially in the robot's equivalent of joint space. We were essentially telling a node to move 10 inches along the tube. So for example, tell this node, move 10 inches along the tube. All of the coordination of how these different actuators need to move together was performed off-board in a computer, and then just the robot almost served as a, as a playback device. So what we'd like to do now is move the coordination from off-board to on-board. Instead of um, communicating commands in joint space, we'd like to perhaps think about a command coming in task space. So for, exa for example, tell this roller module to move up or move down or move to the right or to the left. And then all the coordination doesn't happen off board, but happens on board by each of these robot nodes talking to each other. In some ways, we'd almost like to shift from thinking of this thing as, as a big robot to almost a robot made out of robots or like a robot collective. And so that's really drawn us into this uh, field of studying um, robotic collectives. And so I've highlighted a few other uh, um, advances in, in robotic collectives here. Often these things are inspired by swarms in nature. So here are a bunch of individual robots that can move, kind of collectively take a, a greater shape. However, each of these robots tends to be quite complicated. It has to be able to move on its own. It's almost like thinking of each robot as a, as a fish in a school of fish. Another alternative is you could connect a bunch of robots and then use some sort of statistical or even like a machine learning approach to kind of have them take random action and eventually decide how to move. So these robots here are simpler, but they have to kind of, kind of experiment to determine how to move, and their motion ends up being much more emergent and less precise um, th th than perhaps one would like, at least for a truss robot. There's also been some work leveraging the specific structure of a truss. So if you have a truss that follows a chain-like architecture, there have been some techniques on distributed control for this robot. So what we'd like to do is think of each node of the robot as its own computer, um, its own individual robot that's talking to its neighbor. So if we imagine ourselves being this node, we can communicate with our neighbors. Or if we imagine ourselves being a top node, we can also communicate with our adjacent neighbors, but there may be some nodes of the structure we're not talking to. And what we'd like to do is be able to find a way to coordinate the motion of all the robots on the structure, despite only talking to a local subset of the robot nodes. And so what I'm going to do now is kind of outline the algorithm and, and, and how this algorithm that we've developed works. The first step is we're going to acquire measurements. Each node is going to measure something about its neighbors. Um, this could be relative positions or relative distances to its neighbors. The next step, we're going to, each node is going to communicate only with its neighbors, but utilize a distributed algorithm to reconstruct the overall robot shape. So this node is going to pass estimates of the robot state back and forth to its neighbors. And we have an algorithm that guarantees that the robot will converge to the overall correct shape of the robot, um, despite the fact that it's not talking to all of these different nodes. So once the robot has an estimate of the shape shown by this, this red dashed line, then we'll run another iterative and distributed algorithm that will allow each node to obtain an estimate of each node's velocity of the robot, so how each node wants to move. The, the cool thing here is that not every node maybe even know why each robot wants to move. So say, for example, this robot wants to really move to the right. Um, perhaps it's sent something in that direction that it, that it wants to get closer to, or perhaps the offboard human with a joystick has, has commanded that motion. Um, that robot wants to move to the right. No other robots of the ro no other nodes of this robot will know that, but through this iterative algorithm, they'll all converge to know how to act to enable that motion. Of, of, of one individual node. And then after determining those velocities, each node will compute the local action needs to apply and it will apply that control action um, and, and be able to achieve a motion. So we have this algorithm that allows local communication but global coordination of this robot system. So the real magic sauce here, the secret sauce is, is what do these distributed algorithms look like and how do they work? 
if we think about the first section, we phrased the control as an optimization problem that looks something like this. Minimize some cost function subject to some constraints about how certain nodes move or how the ground nodes of the robot were maintained. What we're going to do is we're going to translate this centralized optimization problem to a distributed optimization. We're going to break up this cost functions into components from one to n. And then each robot is going to maintain its own estimate of the overall robot states of x. However, we enforce this extra constraint that for this optimization to be solved, all those estimates must match. What this means is if I find an, op an optimal solution to this problem, it also optimizes this problem because of this consistency constraint. And so what we need to do is find a way to solve this distributed optimization problem using only local communication. I'm not gonna address the math in detail here, but we use is essentially an algorithm called consensus ADMM that allows this iterative message passing procedure um, that allows these nodes to converge to a, a shared state estimate that minimizes the objective function. Um, to kind of illustrate this uh, schematically, this is the belief of every robot on the motion of the top node of, of that robot I showed previously. So while at first there's disagreement, they all converge to a shared estimate of that top node motion. These are the motion constraints. Slowly the violation of those constraints goes to zero as we complete more iterations. And this dashed line here shows the centralized optimization. If I solve the centralized optimized problem, I get this dashed solution. And you see that the distributed solutions converge to that shared dash solution. So what does this look like in practice? If I command the top node of this robot to move to the right and then back to the left, what I get is a behavior that looks like this. Um, the robot uh, is able to coordinate the motion of these actuators independently to move out to the right and then back. I should mention in this case, I'm looking at this robot as a, a collection of linear actuators. So similar, so each of these actuators can change its length independently. Now, unfortunately, due to the coronavirus pandemic, we're unable to do very many physical experiments on this robot. However, what we can do is we can inject noise into our simulations. So when each node measures its neighbors to reconstruct its shape, we inject essentially normally distributed noise with different variants. And what these simulations will show is this dashed line, this gray dashed line is the robot's reconstructed shape. So what we see is with noisy measurements, with different levels of noise in the measurements, how that affects the performance. And what you'll see is that we do get a deviance of the trajectory of this top node, but we actually get remarkably um, robust performance even for how much noise there is in this reconstructed state estimate. Um, so this gives us encouragement that these distributed algorithms have some natural robustness to, to noise um, during, the, during operation. Now, one thing we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to take this algorithm and also apply it to the isoparametric robot that we did previously. And to demonstrate this, what we're going to do here is I'm going to command a motion of the center of mass, which I've illustrated with the, with the sphere here, with the joystick. And you'll see the commands coming from this arrow that I superimposed on this figure. And you can see that by commanding the motion of the center of mass, I'm able to coordinate the motion of all of these different roller modules um, to move back and forth, even while respecting all the constraint, the physical constraints of the system and the constraints that each of these tubes remain constantly. So we're able to take this distributed algorithm and use it um, in integration both with conventional truss robots with linear actuators that lengthen the shoring, and also with these isoparametric. And so as a conclusion to this section, we've, able to, we've enabled a robot that's physically connected but distributed. So it's almost like a, a physically joined collective. Um, each node communicates only with its neighbor, and we have algorithms that enable each robot to determine the overall state of the robot and also allow the robots to coordinate their motion, allow the nodes to coordinate their motion to satisfy global objectives or local objectives, even if they're unaware of them. For example, node one in the robot may have no idea that roads, node six is trying to move up, but it's still able to help and coordinate its motion to achieve that. The result of this is that we have a robot that now has some modularity in hardware, but also has modularity in its control algorithms and software as well. So each of these nodes can really function and, and compute its control independently. And that also gives us the ability to in, integrate more local information. Say, for example, one node breaks, um, it can uh, enforce the constraint that it that its actuator stop moving without communicating to the to the other to the rest of the robot what happened. So it does allow this sort of local information to, to have a role on the network. 
And so with that, I'd like to talk just briefly about some of the places where I think this, this work leads. And so one obvious example is that it would just be really cool to take the robot that we built and build way more of these roller modules and see what can happen in really, really high, high definition in some ways. And so this is a, an animation that I've generated of a robot composed of many constant perimeter triangles. So it'd be like our robot, our isoparametric robot, several of them glued together. And we've coordinated the motion to just kind of move the center of mass around. And then at this point, it's also going to kind of pick up the leg of this robot. So these algorithms can potentially scale to this really large scale um, robotic systems and really enable almost like a, a really, yeah, like a glob of robot that could really change its shape dramatically based on different paths or different environments. It'd be cool to even think of like a, a really fast 3D printer. You put this blob on your desk. I mean, it can kind of change its shape to, to approximate things that you, that you may be working with or want to visualize. Um, another application that I'm excited about is, is rough terrain locomotion um, due to the large shape changing ability of the robot and specifically using this robot uh, as a potential rover for space exploration. Um, due to its inflated nature, the robot could deflate back into a super small volume. We could ship it to, to some moon, say, say Titan or something, um, it can inflate once it, uh, once it arrives, and once it's inflated, it can wander off on its own, um, operating fully untethered and capable of using its really dramatic shape-changing ability to potentially locomote over really rough and, and varied terrain. Um, NASA has actually invested some significant resources in studying tensegrity robots, which are, it's a different concept than the robot we've presented here, but um, conceptually and, and visually, it, it, uh, it has some, some similarities. They've been really excited about this robot for its shape-changing ability. I think the, the inflated isoparametric robot can potentially achieve the same level of shape change, perhaps even larger levels of shape change, and also have this deflate and inflate ability that makes it really promising for, for space exploration. And so a conclusion, I just want to return to this point that we, we've developed this, this new type of robot, this totally different type of robot. Um, we've integrated the design and control. We could not have designed this robot um, without considering the kind of the unique challenges presented by controlling this robot. And we could not have developed a useful robot if we just weren't thinking of control and, and not design. And so I'm excited about both this robot and others, really the types of robots that we'll be able to create and develop by considering the integrated design and control of, of different types of robots. And so that's my uh, conclusion of my, my thesis presentation. I'd, uh, I'd love to give a few acknowledgments um, briefly and then perhaps after acknowledgments, we could kind of have a, an, an open Q&A um, type session. Um, so, that, so yeah, at this point, I'll proceed to acknowledgments, which is perhaps the, the, more, the more relevant and perhaps even entertaining um, portion of the thesis defense. And so uh, Mac and Allison introduced me today. Um, I just like to say that during your PhD, one of the biggest advice people will give you is you have to find a good advisor. If you find a good advisor, um, your PhD experience will, will, will go well. I lucked out because I was able to find two uh, amazing advisors, and I just could not be happier with, uh, with uh, the guidance and the mentoring that, that Mac and Allison had given me over the last five years. Um, Mac is incredibly patient, um, detail-oriented, and has really been able to, to increase my ability to think about complex problems and, and reason through them, um, has really improved my thinking. Um, Allison has just been a, an enormous supporter of my work and encouraged me to, to, pursue, to pursue my interests and really given me all the resources that I need, that I need to succeed. Um, both Mac and Allison have just been so supportive and have really created an environment um, for, for, for me to succeed and created a research group um, where I was able to succeed. So I am extremely grateful for them, um, for how they've helped me professionally and really the, the, the help and blessing they've been to my personal life over the last few years as well. Um, I'd like to thank the rest of my committee, um, Elliot, Sean, and Jeanette. Um, so Elliot and Sean have also been able to work with extremely closely. We've authored papers together. Um, they helped really closely on the development of the isoparametric robot. Um, so I almost feel like in some ways I've had four different advisors throughout my PhD. Um, they've been enormously supportive and, and enormously helpful. I'm thankful for Jeanette for being the chair today. I also had a fantastic experience in her manipulation class um, when, when I took her man manipulation class a few years ago at Stanford. And so I'm, I'm just really grateful for, for all these committee members and, and their contributions to my, to my PhD. Um, so another thing, a PhD tends to be a very solitary endeavor. Um, that has not been the case for me at all. Um, this is Zach. He really, uh, 
line, you know, line by line of code and, and side by side, uh, we were able to build this, this isoperometric robot together. Um, I, I don't think I could have done it without him. And it, this was really a, a joint effort in, in all senses of the word. Um, this right here is the time lapse of the first time that we ever put the, the octahedron robot together. Um, what you don't see in the time lapse is it collapsed right after, right after we put it together. Um, but we eventually figured it out. And so I'm extremely grateful for Zach. I said that he, he's co-parented the robot with me. Um, sometimes it feels like the robot's been, a, been another kid throughout the PhD. Um, I've had not one, but two awesome research groups. Um, these are um, pictures taken at, at various points throughout my PhD of the MSL and the Charm Lab. Um, I've tried to list just some of, my, uh, some of the students I've collaborated with here. I'm sure there's, there's probably some that, that aren't on the list, but these are people who I've you know, been able to work with, who I've been able to do classes with, who I've just really been able to get support of in, in a number of different ways. So I'm extremely grateful for, for all of them. Um, thankful for some funding sources, um, NSF, NRI, um, and, and some other funding sources that were able to support my PhD work and really allowed me to explore a project that I was, that I was super, super passionate about and interested in. I'm thankful for my church community and uh, thankful for my family. So this is my family and these are my in-laws. Um, most of these people have stuff on my floor at some point in our apartment. So uh, super grateful for them and wouldn't be here without them. And then uh, thankful for my immediate family, my wife and kids as well. This is us the morning we left uh, Utah. So this is the truck loaded up. We're gonna drive to Stanford. Uh, that's baby Peter, he was 11 months old. Um, so it's a pretty unusual situation to come to grad school with, uh, with a small kid. So it's it very unique. And in fact, this was hammered home. One of the first weeks here, we went to a Stanford football game. Um, this is us there. And we tried to go in the student session and the usher wouldn't let us because we had a kid. He says, what? There's no way. You can't be a student. You guys have a kid. You can't go in the student section. Um, so we eventually, we eventually talked him in and we got into the student section. Um, so at first I was like, oh man, is, is grad school going to work out with a family? You know, it's a very, very different situation. Um, I will say, I think that's the, the time that it was the hardest having a family. Since then, I've just received enormous support um, having a family from my advisors, from my lab mates. Um, so these are my kids. Lucy was born in December. Owen was born a few years ago while we were here. Peter was 11 months when we came. They were able to meet the robot and we made it back to some Stanford football games back into the student section. So uh, it was really a fantastic place to, to raise these guys for the, for the beginnings of their lives. And then um, of course, thankful for my wife as well. But I wouldn't be able to be here without her. So I'm, uh, yeah, can't say enough. And if I say too much, I'll just cry more. So really grateful for her. I would just say you're the real MVP is, is, uh, is, is what I would say to her. And so with that, I'd, uh, I felt like I would need something to lighten the mood after all those acknowledgments. So uh, here's a blooper reel of the robot crashing a, a, few, a few different times. So there will be a few different shots. Sadly, it didn't work every time, um, every time that we tried. Um, but yeah, uh, just want to say again, thanks, thanks for everyone for their contributions and, uh, and thanks, for, thanks for being here as well. And so with that, I'd, uh, I'd love to be able to take some questions on, on my work. Um, I think the best form is, so I think there's maybe two forms is in, in uh, Zoom, there's a way to raise your hands. Um, if we have someone raise their hand, we can call on you, or there's also a way you can ask questions through the chat. Um, so I think either, either way that, I, I'd love to take some, some questions. Thank you very much, Nathan, for your wonderful talk. Uh, really exciting work. So yeah, please, uh, anyone who has a question, either use the chat, as Nathan said, uh, or just raise your hand and I monitor the, the participants box as well. Please go ahead. Uh, Laura, you are having a question. Uh, yeah, great, great talk, uh, Nathan. Uh, I very much enjoyed the blooper reel that you put at the end here. Uh, and my question is kind of related to that because you, you talked about this, this idea that you would like to make uh, even more complicated um, uh, structures out of these. And I am wondering what your thoughts are on uh, kind of 
increasing the stiffness or the strength of the robots and what are the current you know abilities of the robot to support additional weight uh, on top of just its own body weight? Yeah, great question. Um, I think I even maybe have a backup slide that answers part of that. So really, really good question. Um, so in our current robotic system, uh, we can do things like this. So this is moving 15 pounds um, back and forth. Um, and this feels to be about the limit kind of of our, of our current, uh, current robotic system. So like 15 additional pounds of, of payload. It's a little bit a function of, of the configuration. Um, in terms of, of scaling up, certainly that's a challenge that we need to be able to overcome. Right now, one of our limits is that um, the roller modules themselves, we can't um, support very much pressure. So if we increase the pressure of the tube, which increases the strength, that actually starts to bend the rollers that, that pinch the tube. So I think in a, in a future iteration, really building much uh, stronger rollers would allow us to increase the pressure of the tube, perhaps by an order of magnitude. Right now we're operating at about seven PSI or like 40 KPA. I think we could probably do, yeah, maybe not an order of magnitude, but maybe up to like 50 PSI or something like that. We could potentially do much higher pressure, which would increase the strength dramatically. Um, and then I think there's also chances it is configuration dependent. So perhaps even if you had a bigger structure, you could in your controller be reasoning about how the shape of the robot affects the loading and then perhaps even control in a way to, to kind of optimize the loading. Great, thank you. Any other questions? So yeah, either use the chat or if you go to the participants box of the Zoom window at the very bottom, uh, you see the list of participants and there's a little icon which says raise hand. So please go ahead if you have another question. Uh, Zhang Ho. Um, hello, I am Zhang Hobe from Cloud Lab Yupen. So I have a question. So you develop a distributed control method for this robot. And so um, which information each joints are getting for this control? Yeah, ex excellent question. Um, so in the distributed controller, each joint is basically measuring something about their neighbor state. So it's either measuring the position, the relative position or the um, relative distance to, to its neighbor. And then through these iterative algorithms, what it does is essentially reconstructs the shape of the robot. So every node is maintaining an estimate of the full robot state. And then, so that's in the state estimation algorithm. And then in the control algorithm, each node is estimating the velocity of all other nodes in the network. So, so at all points, the messages passed back and forth are either estimates of the full state or estimates of the, the full velocity state of the robots. So um, is there any um, hardware impl implementation for um, the, uh, measuring those information or? Do you have the message? Question, no? and there's, there's not a fully developed system in part because of the coronavirus, um, <laughs> exactly what we were working on. Um, what we're working on though is um, using basically inertial measurement units on, on each node and then using the length information and using a fusion of those two informations to be able to compute the neighbor's positions basically. Um, so using a combination of of yeah, edge length information and then also orientation information to, 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 to generate those measurements of neighbor positions. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, and I'd be happy to chat more and I'm really uh, excited by the Mod Lab's work on, on similar architectures as well. So yeah. <laughs> chat if you'd like. All right, we have time for more questions. So please go ahead if you have one. Yeah, I think if there are no additional questions, it seems, then I would like to thank Nathan again. Oh, there's one. Okay. Uh, from Alexander. Um, in the distributed control example, you commanded the center of mass to move. Which node, which node gets that message? 
Excellent, excellent question. And so you actually have a choice um, because every node is maintaining the full velocity state. Uh, actually, any node or subset of nodes could enforce that command. Um, the difference is the speed of convergence. So for example, if I broadcast that command to all nodes of the network, I will converge faster. And if I broadcast to one node of the network, I'll still converge to the, to the correct commands. Um, however, the convergence will be a little bit slower. So there is some freedom in kind of which nodes receive that command, um, but in practice, it has to be at least one, and, and it could be up to all of them, and that would speed convergence slightly. Thank you. What can you say about the cost of the robot, Nathan? Yeah, good question. So um, we had this, this vision of it being really low cost, and perhaps it is compared to other robots. I, I think our last estimate was that each node, so each roller module, I think is about, um, I think it's about $250 or so. And so this octahedral robot is, is eight active roller modules. So eight times 250. Um, so, you know, we're looking at a, you know, a, a few thousand dollars or so to, to construct the robot in its, in its current form. Um, now, what's interesting is that really there's not any one component that's especially expensive. Like, I think our most expensive component is the, is the motor, which is like a $40 hobby motor. It's just then we need a radio board and a microcontroller and batteries and, you know, it's hardware, gears. Um, so I think there is a potential for this to become uh, like a low cost system. I, I've long dreamed of like a, a modular kit, like you said. School, you know, it contains 20 robot modules and you route the tubes however you want. There is a chance for that, um, but in the current system, it's not quite at that level. It's a little too expensive for that right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Daniel, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Hey, Nathan, congrats for this work. This is so cool. Um, my question was around uh, miniaturization of this robot. So, so are there any, what are the limitations or how small can it go and what, what would you run into? And um, does it affect payload capacity, for example? Yeah, that's a great question and one that we've actually thought a lot about. So in the first case, we probably made this robot way too big, uh, but we were excited about making a really big untethered robot. Um, especially with the, the inflated nature, it's really, really hard to make a giant untethered robot. So part of our idea of making it big is we just wanted to kind of see how big we can go. Um, in terms of changing the scale, so there's a few interesting effects. If you think about like changing the, the length, um, so like a, a nominal length of the robot, the payload capacity is essentially going to go up with length squared, um, but the mass of the robot is essentially going to go up with the length cubed. So as it gets bigger, eventually it will get to a point where it can't support its weight um, if you scale everything uniformly. And what that means is that as you get smaller, it actually scales favorably. So you can have larger and larger payloads as it gets smaller. Um, another interesting effect is by changing the diameter of the tube, um, you actually get a diameter to the fourth increase in um, buckling load. So potentially, you, you could actually get really, really big. The tubes would just have to get proportionally fatter. Um, and then in terms of like extreme miniaturization, um, I think there is like some questions about like a, like the just getting like components small enough. Like you know this is relying on on motors and like sliding you know rolling contacts between the rollers and the tubes. Um, I don't know if those things scale well into like an extremely an extremely small scale, but I think there's actually not really any barriers to like at least an order of magnitude size reduction. Like I think we could take nominal one meter edge lengths and turn it into 10 centimeter edge lengths, no problem. And in fact, maybe even perform a little better. Um, if you were to make like a micro version, um, I think you might have slightly different physics of kind of friction and sliding contacts that start coming into an effect. But to be honest, I'm not really sure that would be a really interesting, a really interesting problem. Cool, thanks. All right, so we have another question in the, in the chat. Have you studied how the controllability changes if one or more of the rollers stop working? Is there a way to tell what tasks it can still perform? Yeah, that is a great question. So um, the answer is, of course, you don't have the same level of controllability. Essentially, a, a failed actuator 
imposes like another constraint on the system um, because now there's an edge length that that cannot change or in the isoparametric case there's kind of a, a sum of edge lengths that 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 is coupled and so um, in terms of determining which motions you can do um, there's like an easy way to check like the the rank constraint basically you can kind of see what the null space of the the jacobian is and kind of what motions are are precluded um, by a certain failure but we haven't really studied that in depth um, and that would be an interesting thing to uh to think about especially like um over trajectories like if an, if an actuator dies at a certain point how how would that um, how would that change so the short answer is you can you can tell in the linear algebra you can kind of visualize that but in terms of the implications we haven't really studied what the implications of that are thank you um so uh if there's one more question uh you could either raise your hand so jang ho has his raised again so that's going to be the last question for today uh it's jang ho bay again and um it seems um sometimes the two jo two adjacent joints are not moving correctly same position so have you experienced problem of this and if so uh, how did you solve this problem could you describe that to me again? So the two adjacent joints, you're saying? Yes, um, there are four triangles on this robot, and mm -hmm. two joints are um, connected with um, this this linear two linear things. And so some so I think sometimes uh, these two joints are not moving together due to some noise. So if so, these joints will get some. Um, Ten, tensile force and have you experienced this problem so you're talking like these these two joints here like if they're not if they're not moving together like two, two of these roller modules if they're not moving together yes that's correct yeah so each of these does have their own independent controller and so they're essentially functioning independently because you know i could hold this one stationary and i could drive this one up and down the tube um, and there's this degree of freedom, there's this universal joint coupling these two. So there is, it is possible for those joints to move um, relative to each other there. Um, and we do essentially control them independently. Like I could drive this guy and th this node independent of, of this node. Um, and there's not really any um, limitations there. Does that, does that answer your question? Um, I think so. Thank you for your answer. Yes. Yeah, and I, I guess I should say too, this structure, this graph is like, a, is minimally rigid or statically determinant such that um, there's each, each actuator can move independently. Like there's no problem. You don't need to coordinate the motion of the actuators, in which we actually leverage and control. Typically we just broadcast a command to a bunch of nodes at once. We don't really worry about the intermediate configurations all the time, but we know we'll end up in the right configuration. So the motions of each of these actuators are decoupled physically. Okay, thank you for your nice presentation of your robot. Thank you. Okay, with that, we are gonna close the Q&A session. Uh, thank you again, Nathan, for your great talk. And uh, with that, um, we're gonna, the committee and Nathan are gonna meet in the closed session now. And I thank everyone who came to um, the defense talk. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Goodbye.